Hello, everyone. This is your host, Sanjeev Goyal. Every month, we bring a special guest, one of our own alum, to talk about the future. This month, we have invited Amrish Malpani. Amrish is CTO of SAP Conquer, and he has extensive background in security as well as in education. So let's talk to him about his take on future. Amrish, welcome to our show. Thanks a lot, Sanjeev. Happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So Amrish, what was your hostel? Ah, I was in H9 in IIT Bombay, kind of many, many, many years ago. So hostels were much simpler at that time. Uh, they were, IIT was a more sparsely populated place. I think nowadays when I go to IIT, I can't recognize it. There are just so many buildings, so many people uh, used to be a lush green place, not a whole lot of people used to actually get cold. So, which isn't something I can uh, say about a lot of parts of Bombay right now. Mumbai. Amrish, you know, 1.3 billion people need more engineers. In our time, there were less people, so less engineers. So I guess that's what is <laughs> causing all this. Our audience will love to know about uh, your life and IIT. Anything interesting you would like to share with us? Uh, lots of interesting episodes. I guess the first one that I remember was during orientation. And uh, one of the things is we went and I forget who the professor was, but somebody was kind of saying, okay, you guys all obviously got through the uh, entrance exam and stuff like that. Very good. Congratulations. You're all very smart, etc. How many people think that they got over 70% in the math paper? Right, and I think one or two hands went up, and you know, I go, "Wow!" Uh, how many people think that they got over sixty percent? And we had seven, eight, nine hands go up. How many people got over fifty percent? And you know, now you start having twenty or so people put up their hands. And then he said, "A grand total of two people got over fifty percent." And you know, it's you know, the big revelation to me was. There are kind of two kinds of people, right? The people, you can either call them optimistic, you can call them uh, whatever, right? They feel that they've done a lot better than they have. And there's a set of people who tend to downplay things uh, where, you know, even when they say they've done badly, you kind of feel that, yeah, they most probably have done, okay, let's not worry about them. But, uh, the, the other interesting aspect of it is you will run into this in real life too. It's very interesting, right? I mean, I've worked in a bunch of startups and often a person who is a founder and a CEO, right, lives life and looks at the world through pink-tinted pink lenses, right? The world is always rosy. It glows, right? And that's something that's a strength that you need to have, an attitude you need to have to believe that your startup can go anywhere, right? Uh, so there's pluses and minuses. You want to make sure you don't drink too much of the Kool-Aid, but you also want to make sure that you are in a place where you can drink a little bit of Kool-Aid because that's what's going to give you faith that something's going to work. Well, Amrish, we both know if you don't believe in yourself, why will someone else believe in you? And yes. some value is built on that. Yes. And we both yes. are recipient of it. We are all here because we got so much love and so much support from our friends and especially people from Silicon Valley. So this is amazing. And we both believe that place is, is still amazing, no matter what the rest of the world says about America or Silicon Valley. So let's talk about your life. You co-founded a company which got public. Then you got into security. Then you move into education. And now you are with SAP Conquer. So how a startup guy become CTO of like multi, multi billion dollar company? It's, it's very interesting to me and intriguing to me. And I'm sure our almost 250 dollars alum must be wondering how is possible the guy, he was sitting in the same desk. Now he is CTO of SAP. You know, and I can't say that any of this is planned, right? Through, I feel, through a lot of my career, and this is gonna be true for a lot of people, a lot of things happen because of luck, 
chance, opportunity. Uh, you know, the good news is good things will happen in everyone's lives, right? You will all get chances. We will all get chances. Part of it is how many of those do we take? How many of those do we not take? Right, so even if you kind of talk about Valisert and founder of Valisert and stuff like that, right? I can't say there was a grand design or anything like that. Uh, I met uh, uh, one of my ex-colleagues, another person from IIT Bombay, uh, Chini, and we kind of were uh, hanging out, having lunch at one of our favorite places. And the deal was, you know, more like boss kuch karna hai, right? And kuch karte hai, and when we had started, I don't think we quite knew what we wanted to do. Approximately, you know, there is this issue around certificates, digital certificates. They're going to take off. Validation is a little bit of an issue. Let's go do something around there, right? But that was a little bit of the start, and then that evolved. So one of the tricks is hanging in there, trying to do something, and even if what you originally plan to do doesn't quite pan out, just because you are there, other opportunities will present themselves, right? So some of it is around, you do want to take a few chances in life. And particularly if you're going to do startups, you want to make sure you hang in there for a reasonable amount of time, right? There were times, whether it is the Valisert story, right? You kind of go from, oh, we just raised a little bit of money to shit. The people who are going to fund us aren't going to do it. Our big customer just disappeared and evaporated on us. This person who we wanted to partner with has said they're going to refuse. All this stuff is going to happen, right? Some of it is just giving things a little bit of time to iron themselves out to see what new opportunities you can come up with. So if I ask you to summarize, your entrepreneur journey, traits of that. And if I say only three things, so what will be that? One of them is be curious. At all times, uh, my golden rule is you can learn from pretty much anybody, right? It could be the person who's come to fix your plumbing. It could be somebody who is cleaning your house. It could be somebody who is, you know, a guru in a particular field, right? Be curious, try and learn. All learning will end up helping you one way or another for you know whatever reason, right? So that's one important thing. Learn, patience is important and learning to do the dirty work is important, right? Uh, in every company, there is always the cool and fun stuff to do. And then there is the boring stuff that you never quite wanted to do, but you need to be okay with doing that. Right. And I think, you know, growing up in India actually gives us a little bit of an advantage. There's places where you have to stand in line, the government officials that you have to deal with that you never wanted to deal with. Right. So there's a little bit of acceptance of that. There's a little bit of it's 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 OK to do that. Take chances. Right. Uh, if you don't take chances, um, you know, lady luck can't come and help you. Right. So. So let's talk about the future. You're in Silicon yes. Valley for more than 27, 28 years now. Yep. You were, came to the US and started your career in Silicon Valley. Internet was starting. It was not even there. Yes. You cannot even visualize how internet is going to shape the world 28 years ago. Yep. But if I ask you to predict our future in 27 years from now, for 28 years, so roughly around 2050 and beyond, what you think will be? And specifically, I want to talk about the future of work. So, you know, one of the things that I have figured out, right? You know, again, there used to be a time when uh, I'm sure people still feel this way, right? Particularly if you're an IIT alum, that you are particularly smart, gifted, very intelligent, and stuff like that, right? And the thing that you, do or should realize is for a lot of us, we have had a huge amount of opportunity that India was never an equal playing field, right? At our time, particularly 
if you lived in one of the three or four big cities, right, you saw a lot more of the world. If your parents were well educated, if your parents could send you to good schools, right, that helped a lot. Parents even feeling that education is important gave you a big advantage. Um, so, and the fact that, you know, you were in India in a place where you, somebody actually went out and created these institutions, right? Uh, there's no reason why India could afford to create IITs in whatever the 50s or 60s that they did. Somebody thought about that. Other people decided to go teach over there. Um, there's a lot of opportunities and chances that we have had that have got us where we are, right? The world is and will continue to be a very unfair place where some of us are lucky enough to get chances and to have some ability to go learn complicated things, right? The two sets of people who will tend to do well in this world today and in the future is either if you're well off, right? You know, pick your parents well, try and inherit a few tens of millions of dollars that helps in life. The other thing is learn, learn throughout your life and be, you know, just again, that curiosity. If you can do that, because the workplace is going to change, you know, whether it's programming languages, how you do stuff. There's this whole now chat GPT stuff that's happening that people say is going to go write code for you. All perfectly fine, right? People who are smart can deal with complexity are going to do well in that world, right? And people who aren't, uh, you know, as I said, if you have a large bond portfolio that's shipping you lots of money every year, wonderful. But, you know, figure out how to be curious, how to learn, how to stay on top of technology. So, Rish, I believe what you are saying every single word. I do believe that as a human, we are explorers. And I know that technology is changing the whole landscape of what we will do in future. However, as an explorer, we will find new frontiers. So let's talk a little bit more about future in 2050. What kind of opportunities will be there, in your opinion, for humanity or things we will be working on, number one? Second is, what kind of infrastructure you can visualize? Because it's not going to be like what a Star Wars kind of movie or high-fi sci-fi movie created that. That's like La La Land kind of situation. I don't believe what is a doomsday. It's going to be something. Mm -hmm. But what will that be? And how can we prepare ourselves today for that future? You know, work is going to change in interesting ways. Um, so, so the thing that actually has shocked me if I look back is how the rate of change in the things we use in what we do, how that rate of change just keeps going faster and faster and faster, right? at a place where it is not clear to me how many people can keep up with that level of change. Again, a good example is, you know, our cell phones didn't exist, what was it, 2006, so, uh, you know, 15, 16 years ago. And now the set of people who know how to use the cell phone effectively have a giant advantage over people who have never, you know, Yes, they can use the cell phone. Yes, they can go make phone calls of it, but who don't actually know how to leverage all the things that your cell phone can get you, right? So I think adoption of technology, uh, you know, the, the not feeling scared of it and the willingness to accept change is going to be a very important skill. Um, being aware of what is happening around you, what is changing in different areas is going to be important. And thirdly, I think mastery in a couple of areas will give you very interesting value, right? So, so even today, 
you know, there's a set of people who are computer scientists, there are a set of people who are electrical engineers, a set of people who are mechanical engineers. Um, being a master of two of those areas, right? Whether it is you are a doctor and a technologist, right? Or you are a lawyer and a technologist. If you understand two areas and can leverage the two together, you are going to be in a much stronger position than if you just know one particular area, right? But, but the other thing, again, as I said, is be curious, learn about related and unrelated areas, right? So just be aware of changes that are happening in the world. It is going to be very interesting. A little bit more objective. So I believe when you and me were growing up, the information was very limited. Mm -hmm. Average, the smartest person may have less than 10% of the information what you and me have today, the smartest yes. person at that time. Right. Today, you and me process information much faster than a person of similar caliber even 20 years ago. So our brain is expanding. So what I'm saying is even humanity is expanding today. We have amazing ability to process information, at least most of us. And rest of the world, they have capability, whether they want to use it or not, that's a secondary thing. So now when it is expanding and we will have 10 billion people by 2050, no matter what we do. So the problems will be multifold too, because as we are expanding, humanity is expanding, our problems are becoming more and more and more complex and interconnected. Whether it's talk about sustainability, we talk about energy, we talk about even pure, simple internet infrastructure. So let's take one problem. And you have done a lot of work and you have seen internet coming from nothing to what it is today. And now we are talking about 5G and all that. So what kind of potential challenges you see, uh, whether in terms of security, or there may be some opportunities around infrastructure, because the way we are doing internet today is too expensive the cost doesn't justify the kind of capabilities and capacity we need in future. So let me put in one thing a little bit before that, right? Part of what you said is we are processing a lot more information and, and dealing with, I feel, a lot of interrupts. One of the things that I have actually questioned is how, you know, we had a lot of time to be bored when we were young, right? And we dealt with one thing, we dealt with one thing for a long time. I see this even in myself. Now I'm starting to deal with stuff in bite-sized chunks, right? One tweet at a time and, you know, kind of things need to change really quickly. And the thing that partly I'm trying to do is to learn to slow down, right? So I want to read and I, you know, occasionally try to make sure I can read a book. And the book could be fiction, the book could be anything, but it is just sustained amount of time on a single task is a skill that you want to cultivate in yourself in this world where you're getting so much stuff thrown at you at any given time that you are, you know, a lot of shallow exposure, not a lot of deep stuff. You kind of have to go figure out how are you going to create those one or two or three areas where you are. So, so that was kind of one thing. Uh, to go back to your question again, what are the areas where there are going to be, let me rephrase, uh, or tell me if I've got your, heard your question correctly, right? Is it, what are the areas where there's going to be a lot of new opportunities or? Uh... Everybody started believing this AI ML and new kind of this chatbot and all that is basically going to make us pretty useless with the current skill set we have to, right? So what are we going to do as a human? And the interesting thing is, I guess, as humans, while technology will improve, while there will be more and more stuff for you to use, um, there will also be a lot more opportunity. The opportunities will often become more complicated. So being able to deal with complexity, I think, is part of what is really important. Uh, one of the skills, by the way, that I would strongly recommend, particularly for IITians, is being able to deal with other human beings. But one of the interesting things, right, if you, if you think about it, Google made search much easier, right? 
So it made the search interface very simple. The interesting thing that I find when I interact with a lot of other people is I feel that I use Google better than most people do, mm -hmm. right? So it's a very simple interface. There isn't a lot of computer science skills that I'm going out and applying out there, but learning how to use search effectively is a valuable new skill that we need to develop, right? And some of it, by the way, I do believe is come back down to the basics, try and understand the basics of how something works and you will be able to use it more effectively, True. right? So sure, there will be chatbots, there will be a metaverse, there will be 17 other things that happen and I'm not even trying to predict which of these will be successful, which of them won't. But if you kind of get the basics of how things work, right? And some of this is curiosity, some of it is being able to talk with other people and try and dissect and figure out uh, uh, how things are, you will become more effective at using them. Sure. And if you are more effective at using them, you will have an advantage over most other people. I agree with that and I understand it. Please help me understand. Do you see in 2050, we will not be tied to any kind of cable? Because even today, internet somehow is connected with some kind of cable. Will we have a word like what Elon Musk is creating for us? Or is it going to be something else when it, we talk about connectivity? Well, okay, so define cable over here, but I don't think I have any cables associated with this. Actually, I don't have any cable associated with my laptop either. Um, so internet infrastructure, you know, those antennas, they are somehow connected, right? And then we have optical fiber, we have different ways of connectivity. Sure. Today. Even today we, and that's the reason the quality of service everywhere is not the same. Quality of service is very different. So should we visualize a future where this infrastructure will be completely disrupted? Because this is also now a 30, 40 year old technology. Um, so in most cases, I suspect you will have varying abilities, right? So today, the things that I need a hardwired connection for, tomorrow I might be able to get it all without, you know, wires, with a satellite connection, with whatever it might be. Um, there will always be things that need faster speeds, mm -hmm. right? The things that need faster speeds are going to have more of a connected mechanism and connected could be a point to point wireless link, but that in my, in, I think in your phraseology is still a wired cable in some ways, right? So um, things that need significantly faster speed, but honestly, the way I look at it today, whether it is my laptop, right? The capabilities of the laptop for what I need to do, I feel have been more than enough for the last four or five years. Right? For, for me and for 90, 95% of the population, right? Sure, there might be the 3% of the population that goes out and does something amazing. For most of us, the core capabilities of the devices that we have are already great. Uh, innovations and things that we are going to go find in the cloud are going to change and there's going to be more dramatic stuff that is available to us. The other interesting couple of trends that I do see happening that either will be good or bad or interesting, right? particularly if you're talking, uh, you know, 30 years out, right? Uh, and these are not necessarily related to software technology or IT technology, right? There is the whole climate change world, right? And there is a strong part of me that does believe things are going to get worse for the next five to seven to 10 years. Uh, but there is enough awareness today that we are going to figure out how to reduce carbon dioxide in the world. The thing that worries me a little bit is around AI and automation and the use of AI either in surveillance or in war warfare. Right, these are two areas where uh, you know the technology is going to improve. It is going to be very hard to put any kind of boundaries on the usage, 
right? And whether it is drones today, whether it is people talking about arming robots to kind of go take action, uh, whether it is around surveillance, which we're already seeing a hell of a lot of, right? These are all areas where it is not clear to me there is any mechanism to limit our usage of that stuff, right? Yeah. That, that worries me a certain way. Our future will talk, we both know, and uh, people used to say the same thing about the internet when we started internet. Uh, banking system, they said everybody will lose the job. And I believe banks today are more, like 10 times or 100 times more people than they used to. So the world has changed. And I still remember people used to have eight to five job, not anymore, because we are pretty much connected and tethered to these devices. And we are uh, pretty much 18, 20 hours on the phone somehow or connected. On the other hand, then you have rules in places like Europe where you do say that you will not send work emails after 5 p.m., right? So, so part of this is how much are we going to, as human beings, try to set rules that control how far technology can push us and how much of it is, you know, technology pushes us in a way and we can't manage it, it manages us. Yeah, definitely we have to have some kind of rules and policies in place so humanity still continue to thrive. Let's talk a little bit about education. And mm -hmm. we have amazing numbers of engineering institutions globally now. Education is becoming more a hybrid learning as well as education is becoming more multidimensional. So if you are an electrical engineer, it doesn't mean you are just studying electrical. So it's pretty uh, learning different uh, skills along with that. Of course, computer science is part of everything today. So what you see our students can do today so they are well prepared for their career. So multiple things, right? One is in terms of material that is available to learn stuff, mm -hmm. there is huge amounts that is all available, right? YouTube is a great resource, right? There are things around physics, that, you know, whether it's Khan Academy, it's particular channels that focus on physics, mathematics, stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff available, right? Uh, there is, uh, uh, whether it's Coursera or edX or a bunch of other places. Are you saying that this is eliminating the structured learning or are you saying these are augmented? Um, these are going to give you access to better teachers than you ever had access to before. Mm -hmm. So part of it is you now have an opportunity. A lot of it is now going to be very much self-driven. Right In the past, you did not have access to teachers. You had to go to a particular class. So depending on which university you got admission in, who the teachers were over there, that's the people, that's the things that you had to learn. The smartest kids today, and you have to be potentially more motivated and self-driven than I ever was, right? Are going to go learn stuff from the smartest people in the world and have access to any topic that you are interested in, right? I interest, you know, I told my daughter when she went to university, figure out who the good teachers are and it doesn't matter what they're teaching. Go sit in those classes, right? Uh, at this stage now, you know, given the equivalence of Coursera and stuff like that, you actually have access to the best teachers across the world. Uh, maybe now you have to start filtering out which topics you want to learn about but go find somebody great teaching it and learn how that stuff works and get it from the basics. One of the worries right now is, you know, again, even in software development, right? People are using these IDs, uh, integrated development environments. You don't quite know how this stuff works. Somebody does something, so magically a set of things happen. And if you don't own your tools and you don't understand your own tools, you are always going to be in trouble. And if you understand the basics of your own tools, uh, so make sure that there is no magic happening, not too much magic happening under you. So you actually know what you're up to. That's awesome. Talk about material science. What is your take? Do you see that we will be inventing new kind of material to even handle the kind of capacities we want on our chips? or you believe that we have exhausted it and now we just have to perfect it somehow? 
Um, okay, so not necessarily my area of expertise. Interestingly, while I was at IIT, there was a lecture by, for people who are from IIT Bombay might recognize the name, Vasi. And he was talking about how we were kind of getting into, you know, nanometer technology. And at some stage, the signals between the wires that are carrying our electrons would be enough that uh, uh, they would start interfering with each other. So you would start hitting physical limits around stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, we are very much in a place where physical limits start mattering, right? And I think if you talk to people who are in chip design, they will completely admit it. Uh, the new innovation, as far as I know, is kind of people are starting to go into three dimensions so that, you know, you're able to go very in interesting ways. So there, uh, and then I guess the other interesting uh, uh, change that has happened is people are starting to do more and more distributed technology, right? The equivalent of the map reducers where I say, Trying to do everything on my one computer isn't quite going to work. Let me go do it on a thousand computers and come back and, uh, and get to the results. So the problem, the need for more speed, more power, more whatever is going to continue to happen. The way people might solve it is gonna be different. So it might not be solved by going out and getting my wires closer and closer together and reducing the nanometer things they will be solved in other ways. Cool, that's interesting. That's, I mean, you know, it's fascinating when I look at the problems. I was talking to another friend of mine, he teaches uh, biomedical and his, the whole work he does is around creating new kind of material, especially for artificial limbs and other part of the bodies, especially implants. And I was surprised, he said, there is not even a single material today, which is identical to bone. and when you get in some kind of implant or to replace some part of your body and you think it is better and it may be, but it is impacting your other part of the body. So even till date, we are not able to create material like bone. So I wonder on one note, we say we are going really fast. We can invent pretty much anything. Uh, information is all there. On other note, we are not able to recreate basic things, which feels like pretty normal to me. Like how complex can it be to create a material like bone? So that I agree with 100%. And frankly, you know, even if you kind of take the whole world of AI and artificial intelligence and stuff like that, uh, people who are experts in this field will still tell you, we are trying to get to a place that a three-year-old kid has already got to, right? So uh, uh, leveraging biological systems to do computation, for example, is not an area that we quite understand. Mm -hmm. So that is a huge other field that I guess, I do not know what the limits of that are, right? So how do neurons quite behave? How does our brain behave? How do we create our memories? And you know, there are ideas and theories and stuff around that that will we be able to get into our computational mechanisms and do we want to and should we are all deep questions that sometimes the answers to those again might be a little scary right you know, awesome. what happens if we what happens if we introduce a biological being that being that is smarter than us right and Oh, of course. In fact, uh, I'll use another interesting uh, example. One of my friend, very close friend of mine, he cloned his dog. And oh. I saw both dogs, like this previous, like the dog which passed away, and now the new dog, the newborn baby, which is like, I think now eight or nine weeks. It's exactly identical. In fact, he even went to the extent that he said, even the behavior is pretty similar. So I'm just wondering, we have built so much intelligence, so much of science around it. So is it just fictitious because everything is at least it's same as a DNA level and it hasn't changed much? So what is what is really the learned behavior and what is the behavior we are born with in our way? Yeah. Yeah. Point I'm trying to make it is technologically, we have recreated a similar kind of being 
based on the previous DNA and which is exactly identical to the previous life. And it fascinates me with so much of computational power and technology we have. It's so how can it is possible that with the same level of skills we had 500 years ago, now we are going so fast. That's what, that is really my question. Uh, you stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Mm -hmm. The deal is lots of people have made lots of innovations over the years that we can leverage, right? I mean, you know, I can't claim to understand any of the Einsteinian stuff, but at least the Newtonian stuff I do understand, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you kind of think five years before Newton came up with whatever he came up with and how amazingly brilliant that stuff was or would have appeared to be to somebody who, you know, didn't understand that stuff. And today we learn it in high school. So, yeah. uh, so yes, yeah. there is. So it's fascinating. Like on one note, we are there. The point I'm trying on other note is we are able to process so much information and we are able to do so much. So as a humanity is expanding, that's the term I'm using. And I think it's not a bad term, but as it is really expanding as our universe is expanding. So that brings to almost to the end of our show today. So do you have any advice or suggestion or any parting thoughts for our audience? Be curious, right? Keep learning, going to be very important. Be humble, opens up. You've been really lucky. Uh, it will make you happy. Um, learn to be grateful. We have had a lot of opportunities, which is why we're where we are. Amrish, I can't thank you enough for your time today. I really had fun. And I'm sure our audience will love to listen to all the things you have shared with them. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot, Sanjeev. Great interview. Thank you.